Um, okay, so I'm going to answer this by sharing the story of the journey to run. Um, so anyone, I think you guys are all aware, you've, you know, driven around your neighborhood and you one day see these signs everywhere with somebody's name on it. Um, that is campaign time. Um, so just to give you some context of how crazy my life changed. So I, one day I went from running my business, you know, making drinks and desserts. Um, and then the very next day, walking away from all of that and running for office. So when you put your name on the ballot, you're advocating for only one person, and that's you. And internalize that for a second, because I know how hard that is to just put your name on a sheet of paper to put your name forward for anything, let alone running for office. So I did that. And my, I had 36 days. That's it. So that's just over a month to make a difference. I didn't, I didn't know that you only had, 36, I had days. 36 days. I did not have a campaign manager. I didn't know that I needed one, but I did. <laughs> so I had, I needed a campaign manager. I needed a campaign office. I needed to raise money because in order for you to have a campaign in the first place, you need funds behind that. So in 36 days, I had to find all those things, get the office set up. I've never, I've knocked on so many doors. <laughs> I just, from the crack of dawn, well, until I was allowed to, until I couldn't see like light. And we were door knocking every single day with my team out there with many volunteers. But if, if you can think about what it takes, you need to raise money, recruit, um, figure out your game plan, create marketing, or have a sign that says your name on it. And it was the most craziest, most intense time ever. Now, that you can already, just from sharing all that, I can, you can probably guess how difficult that would have been. And then, of course, on top of it all, not having experience in politics. So imagine if you're going door to door, the preparedness that I needed to get to, to be able to confidently speak with um, constituents who had a whole lot of questions for me, was it insane? Because questions can be related to immigration, could be related to housing. It could be related to a myriad of other things that uh, we manage at the federal level. And um, so that just gives you some context. Now, um, I'm going to share a story about um, someone who decided during election to advocate for me, my mom. My mom, I, she decided to support her daughter and be brave enough to door knock. So she called her friends, her, my titas, she called them. And she said, guys, we got to go door knocking for my daughter. And so they did. So on her very first door knocking experience, she was there with my red and white t-shirt. She had her list because she couldn't use the app. So she had to like bring her paper and pen. <laughs> and she started to door knock. And during that experience, my mom, probably a couple doors in, had the worst experience ever. She got to a door with someone who was extremely racist. And so she was just door knocking, door opens, the person on the other hand, end happened to not be happy with her presence on her porch, on their porch, and started to yell at my mom and my tita at the door with very racist comments about who she was as an Asian woman and yelling to get the hell out of that doorway, to get out, I don't wanna see you, and slam the door on her face. Um, that story will forever be with me because my mom could have from that moment stopped door knocking for me. She could have quit at that very second, it was her first day being brave enough to do this. And I think at that moment, she realized what her daughter was about to go through for her career that and instead of her being ruined by this experience, which was horrible on her first day, she came back, she regrouped. We had a conversation and she got back out there for the rest of that campaign. And so the, the challenges that we face are one that has to do with being in public office in the first place, which is, you know, being judged for who you are, what you represent. And so we 
I and all the other people within government do experience what it's like being in the public eye and the scrutiny involved um, and the huge magnifying glass that is upon us. But I have to share that story about my mom because thank you, mom, for being there for me. I love you. And also that story represents the challenges that we face uh, everywhere. I hope to meet your mom one day so I can give her a hug um, for being so brave because it's not even scary just for the person running. You could be scary for supporters, for your family. And so um, this type of hate and discrimination and racism is so real um, and it still exists even after you win. You know, even here in the United States, um, I serve in other uh, political boards and I have colleagues who are elected officials, um, Asian women in very progressive um, cities. And mind you, California is a progressive state. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. And we have a majority Democrats uh, represented uh, at the state level. But there's so many stories that I've heard and I've seen firsthand of elected Asian women, elected officials being attacked and the violence against Asian women, the violence against Filipino women, especially right now, that's being fueled um, by a lot of things, um, particularly as we know from uh, the past um, US presidential administration uh, actively fueled um, a lot of anti-Chinese, specifically anti-Asian rhetoric that not just impacted the Asian community, but impacted every person even perceived to have been Asian. Um, I, I see the reports here sometimes in the city of LA of somebody being attacked in public transport or on the street and they weren't even Asian, but because we have masks on, they were attacked. Uh, we know some of them are hate incidents because of the things said prior to the attacks, you know, go back to your country, you know, um, go back to uh, this place. And so we see it and, and we can and, and it really fuels um, this, this really hateful environment where I know people like my mom and my dad and my um, elderly titos and titas might be more feel fearful being out in public. And that's why people like you are so important because um, I know you faced um, some of that on your own even after being elected, but you, you still speak out about it. Um, and it's so scary, but it's, it's uh, just like the message that Anna Marie gave to all of our listeners. I really want to affirm and give back to you that, you know, you are not alone. Uh, if you're an Asian or Filipina elected official or you've been attacked, um, know that there is an entire community here who will wrap our arms around you. Please share your story because it's really important that we not suffer in silence and that we be intimidated into silence. Um, because that's what they want, right? They don't want you to run for office. They don't want you to have power. They don't want you to have representation for your community. Otherwise, they wouldn't be trying to, to bully you and intimidate you. So I just wanted to say that to you, Reggie. Thank you, Jess. Um, I really appreciate that affirmation. And I can share with everyone here, and I have no problem doing so, that... Um, I'm sure in the US, you may have heard the news that we experienced in Ottawa uh, with the trucker convoy. Um, I'm still healing from that time. Um, it was very difficult for me. Um, but I want, now that I'm kind of past it over a few weeks, I can share that a few things with you all, which is that I'm hoping because a lot of times people look at that, that experience and then it actually adds additional fear as to why, again, you should never run. But I didn't want that experience to deter anybody from still considering how important this role is. I did a lot of things after the trucker convoy. So for some context, 
with the trucker convoy that took over Ottawa, there were protesters that took things very far. They were waving flags with very hateful um, symbols that are triggering to so many of us. They would say things that were very hateful. And so I was surrounded by hate. I saw it every day when I went to work. I heard it through the, through the constant honking that didn't stop. Um, I got it all over social media, through emails, through phone calls. My team, my team were overwhelmed. I think on average, we got like maybe several hundred emails per day. And my mail in my mail room was inundated with um, not nice, pleasant things. And even myself within my social media, uh, it, I got blasts of um, racist, um, and violent comments that even wanted to threaten my own family. And of course, what did that do at that moment? It made me see the worst of humanity. Uh, I was talking to you, Jessica, just a few days, actually the same day that some of that happened and I was a mess. And uh, both Anna Marie and Jessica spoke to me and um, just like they said, they wrapped their arms around me and comforted me when I really, really needed it. Because in those moments, you feel alone. And I can tell you that you're not. And you just have to surround yourself with people who will give you good vibes and who will lift you up when you feel at that moment that you are alone and you're not. So from, those, from that really tough time, I was able to get back up again. And it actually formed in me even stronger conviction, Jessica, that I will keep fighting. And I, it didn't deter me from flying to Ottawa and going to sit in my seat that I earned on my own. I went every day, despite the convoy and the protests and the anger and the vitriol and the hatred, I kept on going to take my seat where I belonged. And it has now given me so much conviction to fight every day for all of us and to believe in ourselves and that we belong. And so to all of you who are listening, I can tell you that we all belong. We belong here. We can earn our space and we can take up space rightly so because we deserve it. And so it does definitely take a little bit of bravery, but something more, it takes surrounding yourself with amazing women and amazing people who are going to be there for you and to give you the positive messages that are the things that you actually have to believe in, which are the truth. Whenever someone comes at you with hatred, it comes from a place of lies. And it comes from a place where who, they're, that person's in a very bad place. So just be reminded that the only voices you ever need to hear are the voices in your own heart and by the people that you surround yourself with. That was beautiful. I feel even more inspired by you. And thank you for just sharing your experience and your story. And I know it's been only a few weeks. Um, and so I know it still, um, you know, it still hurts uh, what happened, but, you know, being vulnerable, I think is a strength that women bring to these leadership positions because we are honest about what it takes and the journey that you have, you bring everybody along, you know, um, with you. And so thank you for uplifting women, Filipinos, Asians, Canadians, Americans. I'm so inspired by you. And I hope that you know that um, there's a little girl or a little boy watching this and saying, I want to be like Reggie Valdez one day. And so your impact is going to be immense. And um, the, on a note that I, I did want to add to um, around these anti-Asian incidents and attacks that so many of us um, see uh, on both a, a small way in, in day-to-day um, occurrences um, or in a big way, like what was happening with you and, and being threatened and the livelihoods of your family being threatened. I'm, I'm so, you know, mortified that that um, happened to you, but I know that, um, I know that they cannot intimidate you because it's, it's not just you. You have, like I said, an army of people supporting you. 
But the the message I want to share to viewers is that if you experience or witness a hate incident or attack, please report it. Um, so, so important. Um, for the U.S., of course, um, hate incidents and hate um, attacks um, are actually are, are a crime. And I know one of the things that we have um, a gap in is the reporting, because sometimes um, if it's just like a racial slur that said, people are like, oh, like, I can't, that's not reportable, right? But it is, that's a hate incident. So please, please um, report to uh, your local authorities so they can have this data because this kind of data is what helps inform policymakers like Rechi and myself because we got this data um, from law enforcement um, and we see what's happening on the ground. So, um, and if you don't feel comfortable reporting to law enforcement, um, there's also, at least in the US, um, nonprofit organizations that also collect uh, hate crimes and incidents, and they put out a lot of reports. Uh, one that I'll mention is an organization called Stop AAPI Hate, and their website is stopaapihate.org. And I'll just share um, one of the recent reports that they put out, but from March 2020 until September 2021, uh, nationally, there were over 10,000 hate incidents, over 10,000 hate incidents that were just reported um, against Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And so, you know, that uh, ranges from being harassed on the street to a physical altercation, um, to all sorts of things, to a civil right violation. And like I said, a majority of these hate incidents, over 60% of them, Reggie, were reported by women. So women are being attacked, whether or not you're an elected or appointed official. So please, please report this and um, look up the data um, so that you're informed and you can help um, the women and, and young girls in your life so that they have these resources um, in case something happens to them um, and they, in case they experience um, an anti-Asian um, incident or attack. Um, I don't know if there's any resources that you wanted to say or share, Rechi, from um, the Canadian side or, or how you all treat that, but um, I'll just um, see if you have anything because I just shared some U.S. resources. Yeah, the, the in Canada, um, the I would have to say that in America, when we watch the news there, um, the prevalence there is substantial. We're only starting to learn about it and become more aware of it here. And I think with the the incident that happened with the trucker convoy, how do I say this? It's almost like the hate was all, already there in Canada. It always was, but it woke up just with everything that's been going on. Imagine we've been suppressed for two years given COVID. So the hate is alarmingly increasing in such rapid, at a rapid race in, uh, rate in Canada. And so the resources you shared is because in America, you've been experiencing it for a longer time. In Canada, it's almost as if it's just becoming, it's rising and becoming more prevalent. So there are different, um, there's not one specific to anti-Asian hate like it is in the US, but in Canada, because it's becoming more and more prevalent, um, there are organizations that are looking into it and it's starting. So, and with me being here, I'm advocating against um, and fighting against Asian hate. And I'm definitely speaking out about it more. Um, and we'll continue to look into ways that we can further have organizations to support us, but I would have to say it's almost like it, hate was always there, but it's becoming more and more prevalent here now. Yeah, no, it's it's really scary, and the U.S. has such a complicated history of like anti-Asian policies, from the Chinese Exclusion Act to the internment of 
um, the Japanese community during World War II. Um, and so there's lots of, um, um, you know, government policies in the past, um, I hate to say, um, but it needs, we need to remind ourselves where it was sanctioned by, um, by, by the government. And it's, uh, I say that as somebody from government, knowing that uh, it's important to know our history in the US and in Canada so that we can make sure to fight against hate, to fight against discrimination, and that we don't uh, repeat the same mistakes, especially when um, tensions were so high and still are high uh, from two years ago. And, um, you know, there was one community blamed for the pandemic. And um, it's, it's uh, an active effort. And so you're right, it's, it's hate that, you know, with simmering, simmering below the surface that we're kind of starting to see come out in places like Canada.